Well, good evening, guys. Good evening. On a very beautiful Memorial Day weekend, the Lord has blessed us with. Certainly glad to see each and every one of you. As Lloyd said, I'm batting 500. I've brought as much sunshine as I've brought rain and snow, so we're doing pretty good. And you know, as I started this series of lessons last week, I'm going to continue on. We talked about what season are you in? We're talking about the seasons that Solomon talked about in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Now, how many of you walked away with the song Turn, Turn from the birds stuck in your head after last week? I know I had that all last week and still this week preparing for this. You know, say the lesson I'm about to give, it's always given right here, first and foremost. As we start, what season are you in? Part two. Tonight, we're mostly going to be looking at verses four through six. As I said last week, I prepared this lesson and Solomon was known as the wisest man or one of the wisest men to ever live. And I got to listening to that song, as I said, and I got to hearing the lyrics and thinking about Ecclesiastes and all these things. If you count them, there are 14 different pairs of things that Solomon talks about. And I got to thinking about this and how many times have we read through these? But I, as I said, I'd never heard a lesson given on each thing. And I thought, why not? If he's the wisest man that ever lived, why not look at the wisdom within the wisdom. And so that's what we're going to do more of tonight. In Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1, there Solomon says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heavens. Yes, in this life, as we go through, things are going to change. As we go through, there's going to be things that have ups and downs. But through it all, you can assure that there is a purpose for it all. Having said that, we're going to go into our first point. Number one, we go to Ecclesiastes 3, verse 4. There Solomon starts by saying, there's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh. <laughs> In our life, boy, we've had our share of times of weeping, haven't we? No one is going to get through this life without knowing the pain of loving and losing. We're all going to have a day where we lose somebody we love. A day where we're going to shed tears. A day where the tragedy in our life seems more than we can take. These days are not going to be easy. Just because we're a Christian doesn't mean we have stamped on the back of our hand a pass, a free pass unto heaven, is it? It's going to be tough days. We're going to lose those that we love. We're going to have tragedies in our life. We're going to have depression, times of things getting us down, just like anybody else. A lot of times in life, folks will take the attitude of being a Christian. We, we ourselves even have this attitude sometimes. We get to thinking, well, I'm doing what's right. I'm trying to walk the state straight and narrow. I'm trying to do things according to God's word. Why is this happening to me? We have that attitude sometimes, don't we? We feel like because we're doing what's right, what's godly, that we should have an easier trip through this life. But as Solomon reminds us, there's going to be a season to weep. A season where times are tough. And Jesus Christ knows all about this. If you go to John, the 11th chapter, verses 20 through 35. Here we find Jesus Christ on a day much like you and I experienced many, many times, unfortunately, in this life. We find Jesus Christ getting ready to attend a funeral. Here he comes into the town where his friends Mary, Martha, and of course Lazarus has just passed away. And as he gets back into the town where Lazarus' funeral and his proceedings are going on, is he greeted warmly? Here we find Martha, one of the sisters of Lazarus, coming up to him, basically as soon as he gets into the town. And does she say, Lord, I'm so thankful that you're here. Lord, I feel comforted having you with me. No. She responds by saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
That's a pretty nice welcome as you come into the town, isn't it? It's grief manifesting itself, isn't it? He goes and he comforts her, doesn't he? He reassures her that Lazarus is going to be okay, that he's the resurrection and the life, that things are going to be handled. And as he goes a little further, Mary finds out that he's there. She also goes out to greet him and gives basically the exact same greeting. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And once again, Christ is patient. Grief manifests itself in a lot of different ways in our life, doesn't it? You ever seen folks that have lost somebody in their life that was really close to them? We all handle it differently, don't we? Some folks want to go in a room by themselves, shut the door, and be there by themselves. They don't want people in their face. They want to grieve alone. Other folks, as Mary and Martha here, it manifests in anger. They felt like they were ripped off. That someone that they loved was taken from them. And it came out in the form of anger. But did Christ chastise them? Did he get angry back with them? No, he didn't, did he? Why? Because he understood grief. He understood that there would be a season to weep. And later on, as he approaches the graveside of Lazarus, he looks around, he sees all those that are there that are in such agony and crying and sorrow. He groans within the spirit and Jesus wept. The Son of God Himself was moved to tears at the loss of His friend and at the grief of those there. We should never in this life feel like nobody understands what we're going through in those moments. Nobody gets how that feels because our Savior, Jesus Christ, walked this earth and He shed tears. He's felt every single emotion that you and I have felt in our life. He knows there's a season to weep because he did it himself. But as there's seasons of weeping, there's also seasons for laughter, as Solomon tells us. And we've all had those moments too, haven't we? We've had those moments in our life where we look into our child's eyes, our grandchild's eyes, when we look out on a beautiful day like this and we re remember how blessed we really are. We look around at the house that keeps us warm and cool. We look at the food that comes on our table and we remember how much we've been given. For as many days in this life as we have to weep, to be sorry, to have great sorrow, we have just as many to have joy, laughter, and happiness. Do we remember that? One of my absolute favorite verses in the Old Testament comes in Psalms chapter 118 and verse 24. There we're told that this is the day that the Lord hath made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. How often do we remember that verse? How often do we remember that every single day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Don't waste it. Rejoice and be glad in it. Be thankful for every blessing you get every day because folks, these days roll by fast. Like a vapor, right? Are we taking advantage of it? What's the old Latin saying? Carpe diem. Seize the day. That's what Solomon's reminding us of here. There's going to be a season for laughter. And those seasons should be many, many more than we allow. I've often said this, as a Christian in this life, we should be the happiest people that ever lived. Because when you stop and think about it, we know where we're going when this life is over, Lord willing, if we lead a godly life. We know there's a reward waiting for us. We know we have a purpose to our life. What we're supposed to do to get there. How many folks are sitting somewhere tonight and have no idea what purpose their life holds? 
who are sitting somewhere right now depressed. They have no focus in life, no mission, no purpose, no direction. And on top of that, they believe that this life is it. That this is as good as it gets. The sorrow, the pain, the loss, the things we go through in this life, this is as good as it gets. And when you die, nothing. Blackness. It's kind of a depressing life, isn't it? It's a sad existence. And folks find no hope. But as Christians, we know better, don't we? As Christians, we should be as happy as anybody could be in our life because we know that not only do we get to experience seasons of laughter, seasons of joy in this life, but the best is yet to come. This is simply the appetizer. We're going to get the main course one day when we drop to a knee in front of our Savior. Yes, folks, Solomon says there's going to be times and seasons where we weep. And there's going to be seasons of laughter. There's going to be times of sorrow and times of joy. But through it all, there is a purpose. When we go through those times of great sorrow, those times of weeping, when you finally get to the moments of joy, happiness, you savor them much more, don't you? Why? Because that sorrow lets you know that there are it's low points and that joy lets you know there's high points. And when you get to those highs, boy, you want to hold on to them forever, don't you? There's days in your life that you can remember that in your mind you envision as a perfect day. A day where you wish you could bottle it and hold on to it forever and live on on the memories of, the, of that day. But why do we celebrate? Why do we appreciate those days so much? Why? Because we know there's been other days that were as low as they could be. Seasons of weeping. Yes, we're going to have moments in this life where we reflect on what we've lost. But we're also going to have moments where we appreciate what we have. There will be a season to weep and a season to laugh. We go on. Still Ecclesiastes chapter 3, still verse 4. Now Solomon says that there's going to be a season to mourn and a season to dance. Simply put, I have written here that Solomon is telling us that there's going to be moments of defeat and moments of celebration. Boy, we have those in life. In this instance, Solomon talking about mourning is talking about repentance, reflection. We're all going to have moments in our life where we mourn. Moments where we are defeated. Moments where we don't understand. We worked, we planned, we strived, but for some reason it failed. And we don't get why. We have that in our Christian life too, don't we? How many times in your life have you went through and as a Christian, you've been out somewhere and you've made a mistake. You've fallen short of the glory of God and you had an audience. How many times when you've made those mistakes, have you walked away from there shaking your head, beating yourself up over it as you went to bed that night? Because you and your mind know that as a Christian, I know better than this. I'm better than this. God expects more than this. How could I have let myself make that mistake? The hardest person to forgive a lot of times in life is you, yourself. And there's folks just out there loving it, aren't they? How many times in life have you made a mistake? You've let something slip, maybe a, a word you shouldn't have said, an action you shouldn't have done, and you had an audience. And they're loving every minute of it, knowing that you're a Christian. They're laughing, they're clapping, they're trying to pull, Joe, come over here. You're not going to believe what he just said, what she just said. I wish I had something to record this. It makes their day, doesn't it? They're ready to applaud when you fall flat on your face. Why? Because you're a Christian. You let Joe down the street who does that on a daily basis do it, no big deal. Well, you know Joe. 
That's how he is. But you do it. Someone that professes to be a Christian and it makes their day. We're going to have those moments of defeat even as a Christian. We have them in this life and we have them in our Christian life. And no greater example of this was ever given to us than Luke 22 verses 54 to 62. Here we have Jesus Christ has been taken by wicked hands on the night that he was betrayed and from afar off followed his own disciple Peter. And as they're questioning him and slapping him around by firelight, across the room sits Peter watching it all. And across this time, he's noticed three times, isn't he? By three different groups of folks, all knowing that he was one of Christ's disciples. And each time he begins to deny Christ and each time more vehemently than he did the last time. By the time you get to the third time, I... In, Luke's, or in Matthew's account, we're told that Peter begins to curse and swear and says, I know not the man. But when we get in Luke's account, only in Luke's account, after he denies him that third time, we're told how Christ turns and he looks at Peter. And Peter remembered the words that he told him that he was going to deny him on that night three times. And after he remembered that, he went away and he wept bitterly. Were this was these tears of sorrow? Were these tears of loss? These were tears of defeat. Just like you and I have in our Christian life. Peter walked away that night with tears of defeat, knowing that he was better than that. That Christ expected more of him than that. He had denied his own Savior. There will be seasons of mourning. Seasons of repentance. We're all going to make mistakes, aren't we? Each and every one of us in this room are going to fall flat on our face. We're going to sin. We're going to make mistakes. How do we handle those mistakes? Are we truly repentant? Are we truly going through a season of mourning? Or do we treat it as it's no big deal? Solomon says there will be seasons of mourning. There should be seasons of mourning for us as Christians. That's what repentance is all about. And as we go through those times of mourning in this life and in our Christian life, we're also going to go through times of celebration. There's going to be a time to dance, to celebrate. How many times this time of year is a perfect time for that, isn't it? We get together, we have cookouts for Memorial Day. We remember those that meant so much to us in our life, good memories. We have graduations, celebrations, family reunions. We have a lot of seasons of dancing, don't we? Seasons to celebrate. And God's word tells us about this too. We have this in our Christian life as well. You go to Luke 15, verses 8 to 10. Here we're told that there was a certain woman who had ten pieces of silver. And she loses one. And she begins to take a candle and sweep the house, vehemently searching for this one piece of silver that she lost. And when she finally finds it, what's she do? She calls up all her friends to celebrate with her because the piece she had lost had been found. Doesn't that sound like you and me? What do we do the first time something good happens in our life? Something, we get a promotion, the grandchild or the child accomplishes something. What's the first thing we do? We pick up the phone. We get on that phone. We want to tell people. We want folks to celebrate with us just as this lady did. Why? Because it's times of joy, times of celebration. We want folks to share in it with us. And aren't those seasons beautiful? Those are the seasons that we really need to savor. All the things that go on in this world, the craziness that we go through, the seasons of celebration are the ones you should savor as much as possible. Yes, Solomon says there's going to be times in your life, your Christian life. There's going to be times of mourning, times of reflection, times of repentance, times where you fail. Times where we're defeated. But there's also going to be great times of victory. Times where you accomplish things in life. Where you're able in this life to celebrate the accomplishments that we've had. 
And not only in this life, but in our Christian life. Celebrate the times where you're able to lend a hand to someone and help them. The times where you were able to finally get through to somebody and they walked through that door and sat in these pews. Those are times of celebration. Those are times of victory. Solomon says there's going to be seasons in this life where we mourn and there's going to be seasons where we celebrate. And they both have their purpose. When we go through the times of defeat, we remember them, don't we? When you failed as a Christian, when you failed in life, you don't forget your failures and you learn from them. And when you learn, you accept things and you accomplish things and you don't make those mistakes again. And it leads to celebration. It leads to victory. It leads to accomplishments. There will be Seasons for mourning and celebrating. And they have their purpose. Now we move on. Ecclesiastes 3, now verse 5. There Solomon tells us that there is going to be another dichotomy. There's going to be a season to cast away stones and there's going to be a season to gather them together. What's he talking about here? He's talking about what we go through in life. There's going to be seasons where things are going good. Where we have more than we need. Where we're going to be able to cast some things away. We've got more than enough. We're going to be able to help others. But there's also going to be seasons where we're going to have to gather them stones together. Times where things are pretty lean. Times where we're going to have to scrounge. Times where we're going to have to rebuild. We've all had that in life, haven't we? We've all had moments where things are pretty tough. Right now is a pretty good example, isn't it? Gas being almost, what, $5 a gallon? People not able to make it? Tough times are here. We've all had seasons where we've had to gather stones together and learn how to survive. But we've also had times where things are good. And we can give a little more. We've had that in this life. And we also have it in our Christian life. And Paul tells us what the most important thing of going through both of these seasons is in one set of verses. He tells us in Philippians 4 verses 11 to 13. There he says, in my life experiences, I have learned to be content. I've learned how to abase. I've learned how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned how to be full and to be hungry, how to abound and suffer need. And through all this, what have I learned? I can do all things through Christ, what strengtheneth me. Paul's giving us a life lesson right here, isn't he? He's saying that when you reach the point in your life where you finally find contentment, that's when you're truly going to be happy. Because you're going to have the seasons of casting stones and gathering them together. You're going to have times where you're hungry. Times where you're full. Times where you abound and you abase. Everywhere and in all things. But I've learned to be content. Why? Because Jesus Christ gives me the strength. Because I know God is with me and he will provide. Do we remember that? How many times in life do we worry? And, oh, this isn't going to work out. I'm not going to have enough of this or that. How am I going to get through this? We do that, don't we? A lot of times in life we face things that we don't understand. How is this going to work out? How are we going to get through this? God will provide, but we have to believe it. We have to find that plateau in life where we find contentment. How many people in life chase rainbows, as they say? The grass is always greener on the other side. They're constantly looking for another job. They're constantly trying to get a bigger house, a better car, a better phone. They're never content where they are and they do it at the expense of now. 
And then 25 years go by and they ask themselves, where did it go? Why was I unhappy? Why didn't I find what I was looking for? It's because you were never content in the moment. You never came to the point in your life where you realize that you can do anything through Christ, which strengthens you. Where you can accomplish anything, where God is with you through everything. Learn to be content through the seasons of casting away stones and gathering them together. You have those moments. The seasons where you scrounge, where you're gathering all those stones together, doesn't it make the seasons where you're able to cast them away and give them to others so much better? Aren't you more willing when you've been at the bottom and you've had to rebuild and gather and scrimp and scrape? Doesn't it make you more willing to give when you have more? It does, doesn't it? It has a purpose. Why? Because you know how that feels to be there and you want to help somebody else. There's going to be seasons of casting away stones and gathering them together. And they both have their purpose in our life. Now, folks, we move on. Still Ecclesiastes 3, still verse 5. Now Solomon tells us that there's going to be another set of seasons. That there is going to be an interesting dichotomy once again. That we are going to have times of embracing and a time to refrain from embracing. This is pretty simple, isn't it? A time in life where everything is going great once again. Where we're able to embrace people, love people, agree with what they're doing, pat them on the back, tell them they're doing a good job. But there's also going to be times where we have to refrain from that. Times where we have to exhort. Times where we're going to have conflict and disagreement. And they both have their purpose. We face those things in this life, don't we? And we face these things in our Christian life as well. God's word tells us in Galatians 6 verse 10 that as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those in the household of faith. That's the easy part. That's the season of, of embracing. That's the season where we should live every day as a Christian, the best of our ability. We have opportunities every day to do good, don't we? To all people. We have opportunities especially to do good to those we see every single week sitting in this room. Those that we profess to love, those that are our brothers and sisters in the faith. We have seasons to embrace. Do we do it? That's the question. But they're easy, aren't they? It's easy to help someone who wants to be helped. It's easy to go through and help brothers and sisters of the faith. But what about those folks out in this world? It's not so easy. What about the seasons that we're going to go through where we have to refrain from embracing? Where people are going to disagree with you and you're going to get into conflict even with brothers and sisters in Christ. What do we do then? Well, God's Word tells us and more specifically, Jesus Christ tells us in Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 15 to 17. Here we're given a blueprint on how to handle this problem. And it's probably one of the most overlooked set of verses you're ever going to find in the New Testament. Here Christ tells us that if we have a grievance with each other, we first are supposed to go between us and that person alone and try to work it out. And if that person hears you, you've gained a brother. And if they won't, then what do we do? Then we go back and we take one or two witnesses with us that every word might be established. If the person still won't hear you, then you take it before the church and let everyone hear both sides. And finally... If that doesn't work and they still won't listen to you, then you withdraw. How many times in life, even as Christians, sadly, do we jump right to the last one? 
Well, that guy offended me. He said something against me. I'm not having anything to do with it. I've been in congregations and seen folks that disagreed in churches that sat on opposite sides for years. They wouldn't talk to each other over some issue that happened maybe 25 years ago. That's jumping to the last step, isn't it? We do that in our life too, don't we, sadly? Folks, in this life, that's why divorce rates are so high. Instead of trying to work things out, listen, having someone help us get through things, no, we're going to throw in the towel. We're going to withdraw. I can't deal with them anymore. Irreconcilable differences. They're not following God's plan, are they? And Christ's plan that he laid out so easily for us. Notice how he says in that first one, if you did that, you'd gain a brother. Sometimes if we just swallow our pride in this life, we'll get a lot further. There's going to be seasons where we're easily embracing. This is the easiest season. Along with having a season to celebrate, a season to joy. This is an easy one. A season to embrace is one we could do every day with a smile on our face. But it's those seasons where we're going to have conflict is the difficult ones. But Jesus Christ gives us the blueprint, doesn't he? Even in our own household of faith, he gives us the blueprint on how we are to handle the seasons where we refrain from embracing. Do we follow it? And do we handle things in the right way? That's the important thing. Because folks, so much is at stake. It's not just a person's feelings. It's just not well, you win the argument, I win the argument. This is a person's soul that's on the line. There's a lot riding on it. Solomon says there's going to be seasons where you're going to easily be able to embrace people. But there's also going to be seasons where you have to exhort. Where you're going to have to refrain from embracing. How do we handle those situations? Because each one of them has their purpose. How many times in life have you known someone that did something wrong? was exhorted for it at the time, didn't respond well, maybe fell away. But after a while, it started to sink in. And they realized they're wrong. And it came back even stronger as a Christian than they were before. They have their purpose. And Solomon says, we're going to live through them both. And folks, finally... Number five, Solomon, now we move on to Ecclesiastes 3, verse 6. There Solomon says there's going to be a time to get, a time to lose. Other commentaries also use to replace the word get as seek or search or lose. What's Solomon saying here? He said there's going to be a time, and I have written here, there's going to be a time for ambition and realization. There's going to be times in your life where you chase after goals that to you at that moment seem like the most important thing in your life. Every thought that you have is bent upon it. All your actions are bent on getting there. But when you get a little bit of time and you go through life and you mature, you're going to realize that that goal wasn't what really mattered. There's going to be a time, a season where you seek, 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 search, search, search. And there's going to be a time where you let go, where you lose, where you give up on it, where you realize it wasn't that important anyway. We have that in life, don't we? We all had youthful goals, youthful dreams, youthful, what do they call them, pipe dreams, where things we thought we were going to do, things we thought at the time were the most important thing to us. And then a few years down the road, we look back on it and say, boy, what was I thinking? We've all had that in this life. And we have it in our Christian life as well. And no better place does Paul tell us about the seasons to seek or get and lose than in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. There he says there, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. What's he saying? You're going to have seasons in this life 
When you're young, where do you chase after those things? Seasons of ambition. But as you mature, as you become a man, as you grow in your life, your Christian life, you're going to realize it's time to put away childish things. You're going to realize that that goal, that earthly goal that you had here isn't near as important as that heavenly one that's waiting for you. There's going to be a season to seek. It's called youth. Sometimes it takes folks a long time to get there, doesn't it? How many folks have you known that obeyed the gospel when they were old in life? It took them a long time to get out of the season of seeking, didn't it? There's folks out there that constantly are seeking, what's the answer to life? What's the purpose? What can I get out of it? Why am I here? How many times have you heard that? Why am I here? There's folks that spend almost an entire lifetime in the season of seeking. But hopefully to God, they finally come to the season of letting go of worldly things. And that's what we need to do. In our Christian life, we need to go through both of these seasons because you need to realize by seeking the earthly things that it's a road that leads to nowhere. It has its purpose. And it leads you to the road that leads to life everlasting. You let go of earthly things and you start holding on to eternal ones. Solomon says there's going to be seasons of seeking or getting and seasons to let go or to lose. And Paul did the same. When I was a child, I spake and understood, thought as a child, but when I became a man, when I came matured in my Christian life, I realized it's time to put away those childish things, those youthful ambitions. It's time to realize what matters most. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. That was part two. Lord willing, we'll have part three. It won't be next week, but the week after next. Lord willing, if I'm able to be here Sunday morning, second Sunday morning, I thank you for your attention. The lesson's yours. If there's anyone here tonight who's heard God's word and has been moved to believe it, you have the chance now to let God know that you've heard, that you believe. Repent of the sins you've committed in life. Confess Jesus is the Son of God and be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. Or for some reason in your life right now, you feel like you're in a season where you've drifted away from God. You're not as close as you want to be. There are faithful men here to pray you come back and be restrengthened. If you have either one of those needs, won't you come as we sing the song of invitation?